I would now like to formally begin today's web conference, which is hosted by Kaijin on the topic of pyrosequencing. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our experts for the session. We have Jackie Huckins, Pyromark Application Specialist at Kaijin, and Quan Din, Marketing Manager at Kaijin. I want to wish a good day to both Ms. Huckins and Mr. Din. And at this time, without further ado, I'd like to turn the discussion over to Quan Din. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Quan Din. I am a marketing manager here at Kaijin. I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar. Again, the title is Pyrosequencing, a Rapid and Cost-Effective Technology for Microbial Identifications and Resistant Screening Assays. The webinar today will be delivered to you by our speaker, Jackie Huckins. Jackie is our application specialist at Kaijin. She's one of our few experts on pyrosequencing and pyromark systems. From her interaction with researchers on a daily basis, she brings to you a wealth of knowledge and experience not only on pyrosequencing technology, but also its application. Prior to Kaijin, Jackie worked in the molecular biology diagnostic lab, specialized in metabolic disorders and at the Centers of Disease and Control and Prevention, where she was involved in medium to high throughput pharmacogenetic studies of the U.S. population. In this webinar, you will hear from Jackie how to achieve highly reproducible isolate typing of a large range of species or strains, sensitive testing after minimal culture time, rapid and quantitative detection of resistant mutations that complement phenotypic tests, easy sample preparation and data analysis that is cost effective and can be readily scaled up for high throughput needs, and mutation tolerant assays in difficult samples that cannot be analyzed by other methods. At this time, I will hand over the microphone to our speaker, Jackie. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you all for joining. Uh, as Quan mentioned, I am an application specialist for the Pyromark Systems here at Kyogen. Um, so I am here to uh, help you guys out uh, to develop uh, your particular application and get it up and running in your lab. Uh, my contact information will be shown at the end of the presentation again, so if you have any questions about your particular application, please feel free uh, to, to contact me at the end. Um, I'm just going to uh, start off with an overview of uh, what pyrosequencing is. Uh, so pyrosequencing is a, a, a rapid and cost-effective solution for quantitative short read sequence analysis. Uh, so here's the, the workflow for Kyogen, um, and you can see that with the acquisition of the Pyromark systems, uh, we now fill in this, uh, this uh, workflow. So Kyogen has always been uh, an industry leader for uh, DNA purification and amplification. So now with the Pyromark systems, we can now uh, bring you the entire solution uh, all the way from your uh, sample collection all the way down to analysis. So what is pyrosequencing? Uh, pyrosequencing is what we call DNA sequencing by synthesis. So we're actually going to be uh, synthesizing a DNA strand in real time in front of your eyes. We don't use any gels or labels or probes in our chemistry, so that's what makes it uh, very cost effective and easy to use. Um, and the data that you get off of the pyrosequencer is quantitative. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, different things that you can do with this quantitative uh, aspect of the technology. It's also very simple and robust and flexible. Um, so there's lots of different applications for pyrosequencing. The technology has been out for about uh, a little over 10 years now. And uh, where our publications uh, for pyrosequencing are, are expanding exponentially, so now we're up to about 13 or 1400 publication and publications, and uh, that number just keeps on uh, growing. So this is kind of a busy slide uh, talking about some of the applications that people use pyrosequencing for. But what we're mainly going to focus on today is over here on this uh, bottom right-hand corner in the sequence analysis range. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about different uh, types of uh, microbial typing and resistance typing. But keep in mind with the same platform you can do any of these different applications as well as others. Um, so 
uh, just keep in mind that you can you can also do uh, a lot of tri and tetraallelic SNPs, a uh, very uh, complex mutation analysis, methylation analysis, haplotyping, haplotyping, as well as uh, any of these other uh, applications on the same platform with the same sample prep process. So when we're talking about microbial identification, what we uh, the system that people normally would uh, would purchase would be the Pyromark Q96 ID system. So this is a 96 well platform, mainly used for microbial identification and resistance typing. Um, when you purchase the instrument, what you get is uh, the system. You get the instrument, the vacuum prep workstation, which is used to prepare your samples. And then you also get assay design software and identifier software to help you um, and identify the uh, isolates that you have in your sample. <clears throat> so here is the workflow for pyro sequencing. And I'm going to take you through um, each of these steps uh, one by one. So first of all, what we, what we need, we need to have a specimen. Now this specimen can be uh, just the pure the specimen right out of uh, out of the sample. Um, you may, uh, depending on your application, you may need to culture your microbe, and some people will actually uh, take that specimen and purify the DNA and put that in the PCR. Um, but you're going to take your specimen and you're going to put it into just a normal PCR reaction. It can be a fast PCR reaction if you'd like, um, and then you would go into a sample prep. Uh, process. After the PCR, you have about a 10 to 15 minute sample preparation. And then you put the, uh, your samples on the pyro sequencer. And your pyro sequencing run will take about 10 minutes to an hour to, to identify your samples. The amount of time that it takes for the, uh, the instrument to run is dependent on the length of the read that you want to get. Um, so for very short read uh, sequencing analysis, like uh, SNP detection and mutation detection, you normally get your results within a half an hour after your PCR. So let me now uh, go into details of the, the pyro sequencing process. So the first thing you need to do is to design an assay. Um, and, uh, this assay, if you see here, we have a, a, a sequence. And this sequence contains a variable position. Now, this variable position can be uh, a completely unknown short stretch of DNA. It can be a methylation region. It can be uh, multiple mutations within one region, or just a single mutation that you want to uh, interrogate the quantitation of. Um, but this around this variable position is where we'll place primers in conserved regions of the genome. Now our primers are, are, are normal primers. The only difference is we add this uh, single biotin label on one of the primers. And this primer uh, that's biotinylated is going to be the one that's on the opposite strand of our sequencing primer. So. Um, we're going to use that biotin label to generate a single-stranded DNA template on which we're going to anneal the sequencing primer. Now, the sequencing primer is a little bit different than a, a, a conventional uh, sequencing primer in the placement of your uh, sequencing primer. Um, in uh, Sanger sequencing, you would want to place your sequencing primer uh, well away from your target region. But in pyro sequencing, we're actually going to get uh, sequence information from the very first base after the sequencing primer. So we can place that sequencing primer right up against that variable position. So if you're, when you're thinking about designing an assay, you have a couple choices um, to start with. So first of all, you want to check with our assay design software, our assay database, um, and determine whether or not this assay has already been published or has already been uploaded to our assay database. So when you purchase an instrument, you have access to this assay database. It has thousands of assays that we've either pulled out of publications and pulled the primer sequences and uh, the PCR conditions and everything out, or um, we've de designed these in-house. 
or we've acquired some of these assays from customers. But if your assay is not in the assay database, it's very simple just to uh, design your own assay using the assay design software. And um, basically all you do in the software is you paste your sequence in, you highlight the region of interest, and you hit the play button here. And this will generate up to 100 different assays for you, forward, reverse, and sequencing primer. And um, it'll rank the assays uh, based on uh, what it thinks will be the best assay for you. And you're going to get about a first pass success rate of about 95%. It's a very, very robust software. And a lot of people use it just for designing regular PCRs in their, their labs. Now that we have our assay designed and uh, we've ordered our primers, we're going to do a PCR with those primers that we've designed. And remember, one of those primers was biotinylated. So um, when we have our PCR product, when we generate our PCR product, one of the PCR uh, strands is going to end up being biotinylated. So now we're going to go into that 10 to 15 minute sample prep process that I spoke about. Um, so the first thing you do is you immobilize that double-stranded PCR product to a streptavidin-coated bead. And then you take it through our vacuum prep workstation, um, which is just a series of uh, washes. Uh, so one of those washes is going to be sodium hydroxide. And that's going to denature the two strands and wash away the non-biotinylated strand. And then we just neutralize the sample turn off the vacuum, and release our single-stranded now DNA template down into our pyre sequencing plate, which contains our sequencing primer. So we just heat it up and cool it down very quickly and allow that primer to anneal onto the uh, correct site of our uh, PCR template. So this is a, a picture of our 96-well uh, vacuum prep workstation. So basically, you just, uh, it's about 10 seconds in each one of these uh, stations on uh, the vacuum prep workstation. As you can see on the right-hand side here, there are 96 different filter probes. And uh, the double-stranded uh, double stranded PCR product that's bound to a streptavidin-coated bead will not fit through those filter probes. But everything else that's in your sample will get washed away, all of your PCR reagents and everything. And so you just take it through these series of washes uh, for about 10 seconds at a time, release your sample down into the pyre sequencing plate, and you're ready to put it onto the instrument. So now let's talk about how the chemistry works. So now we're up to, we have our single-stranded DNA template, and we've bound our sequencing primer to it. Now we're putting it in the instrument, and the first thing that the instrument does is it's going to um, add this cocktail of enzymes and substrates into the reaction. So we've got polymerase, sulfurylase, luciferase, and apyrase. And then we're going to add nucleotides one by one into the reaction in a predetermined order. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how you predetermine that, um, that nucleotide dispensation order. But in this case, we're adding a C. When this C incorporates, uh, when this C is added into uh, this reaction, it's going to incorporate across from the G in the template. And a pyrophosphate is going to be naturally released from that reaction. And that pyrophosphate will uh, start this enzyme cascade. And the final product of this enzyme cascade is a light burst. And we can read, using a camera, that light signal um, on what we call a pyrogram. Now, in the meantime, the key to this reaction is this other enzyme called apyrase. And the apyrase is uh, sort of working against the polymerase. The polymerase is just a little bit faster than the apyrase. So as the polymerase is adding all of the nucleotides to the growing strand, apyrase is coming in and chewing up any unused nucleotide and so now we're ready to add our next base into the reaction. Now, this reaction is quantitative as well. So down here where we have two Gs in the template, if we were to add C into this reaction at that point, 
two, G, two Cs would incorporate across from those two Gs, two pyrophosphates would be released, and we would actually see a double height light peak in the pyrogram. So this is what the pyrogram would look like at the end of your run. So anytime there was a base incorporation, we'll see a peak. If there was no incorporation, we'll see a flat line in the pyrogram. Um, Any time that there were more than one uh, incorporation, we'll see a higher height peak. So I can read this sequence as A, C, T, G, C, C, T. And the software can analyze this for you and tell you what the sequence is. Now I mentioned that you want to do a, a, a predetermined nucleotide dispensation order. So how would you determine what type of dispensation order you want to use? Well, that depends on what type of information you want to get. So if you just want to get de novo sequence, if you don't know anything about the sequence, or if you have a very highly variable sequence and you want to be able to know any type of mutation that occurs in that sequence, what you would do is what we call SQA mode for sequence analysis and you would use a cyclic nucleotide dispensation order. So you can see here, below here, we have, uh, we're dispensing ACGT, ACGT, ACGT in the cyclic fashion. Anytime we have an incorporation, we see a peak. If we don't, we don't. The result um, for this type of analysis, for SQA analysis now, are, uh, is a de novo sequence. Now, it's important to note that um, you do have to have a single target. You can only sequence one sequence at a time with this type of higher sequencing um, for de novo sequence analysis. But if you have a mixed sample and you want to know possibly uh, the quantitation of two different alleles that are in a sample or the quantity of uh, two different types of samples, you would use what we call the AQ mode or the SNP mode and you would use a directed nucleotide dispensation order. So this would be for known sequence. You would tell the software what the sequence is, and it will generate a dispensation order for you. And the results are going to be a quantity of different alleles that are in your sample. So now let's go into uh, some of the data analysis. Um, so I'm going to look at some of the different applications that people are using pyro sequencing for, starting with microbial identification using that cyclic dispensation order. And then I'll talk about uh, quantitative mutation analysis, and then some, uh, some more complex uh, applications that people are using pyro sequencing for. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, using uh, pyro sequencing for identification of bacteria, fungi, and viruses. So this is a very similar uh, gra uh, pyrogram than, that I showed you earlier. Uh, the assay design for microbial identification now has a, uh, in our variable position, what we're using here is a hypervariable region of your genome. And we're placing our primers in a conserved region, and we're going to sequence through this hypervariable region. Um, to, get the, to get the identification of your, your sample. So here's an example. We're kind of zoomed in now, uh, and we're looking at the, a, a region of the streptococcal genome. So you can see um, in the gray areas, we have uh, conserved regions, and that's where we're going to place our and We're going to sequence through this hypervariable region. And so you see that this uh, this hypervariable region in the middle here, each sequence here is sort of a barcode that goes back to the species that it encodes for. So all we have to do is look through this uh, 20 base pair sequence or so, and we can tell the identification of uh, all, the, all these different, uh, five different uh, species of Streptococcus in this particular example. Now, a lot of people are using this for different types of, uh, of bacterial or fungal typing or viral identification. So if you're just looking at uh, a general bacterial identification, you can look at the 16S region. 
you can look at uh, gram positive bacteria you can you can look at uh, different targets and in order to uh, to determine the level of uh, identity that you can determine there's also assays that are published for uh, looking at fungi and molds and uh, for viral identification um, if you have, if you have a particular application that you want to look for you can um, you can go to pyrosequencing.com slash publist and you can uh, search for your particular application and you should be able to come up with uh, an application or a publication that might, uh, that might be similar to what you're, you want to do. So this is the data that comes off of the pyrosequencer. So this is the, the run software. Uh, so you can see over here we have 96 different samples that we're running in, in uh, parallel. And this is the results that you get off of the, of the Pyre sequencer. This is for the de novo sequence analysis. So we're now getting sequence information. Uh, this is a pyrogram. And as you see over here, the results can be exported in FASTA format. Um, so if you want to just export your results and uh, compare them to a, a public database like RDP, uh, you can do that. Um, we're also working with uh, Berkeley Labs right now to, uh, uh, to make this data uh, comparable to the, uh, the Green Genes project. But sometimes people have, uh, are only going to see particular uh, species in their lab. And so you don't want to be blasting your uh, results every single time. So what you can do is you can create a, uh, a sequence library, just a FASTA format uh, sequence library that you can then compare directly using this local library um, and, and sequences that you are expecting to see in your lab against your prior sequencing database. So um, basically, the first thing you need to do is just create the sequence library. Um, it's just a FASTA format. You can import another sequence library if you, ha if you already have it in FASTA format. And um, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to take that sequence library now and you're going to use our identifier software to, uh, to actually identify this, uh, your samples. So the identifier software uh, links automatically to your PIRA sequencing runs and compares that to your local sequence library and generates a really nice report uh, with all of your sequences and uh, identities for you. So this is what the identifier software looks like. Uh, you just enter your analysis name, choose one of the runs from your, uh, that's automatically linked to your prior sequencing runs, and then choose the library that you want to compare it to. And again, just hit the play button, and this will come up with all of your results. Um, so on the left-hand side you here, you can see what the report looks like. These are all your sample IDs, and these are the closest results that the software has found. You can click on any of these samples and see a detailed report that contains uh, the pyrogram, which is automatically linked. And then this is your closest hit compared to your library. So this is your... Uh, the sequence that came off of the Pyra sequencer, and this is the, how closely it matches to your library. And it also shows the next closest hit compared to your library. And you can see here that any of these red um, bases are bases that don't match completely to the, to the library that it's comparing it to. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the viral typing assays. So this is the real test uh, for microbial identification because viruses tend to be highly uh, variable. So this is an example of a, an assay that was published uh, using doing HPV genotyping. Um, and here we're looking at the uh, just 150 base pair amplicon of a, a region of the HPV genome. And here you can see our high-risk uh, HPV genotypes, and you can see how differently, very easily, how differently uh, the pyrograms look from the rest of these. And so software can automatically tell you uh, 
whether or not you have a, a high risk phenotype for HPV here. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can use this uh, the cyclic dispensation and this SQA mode for looking at uh, microbial resistance in viral uh, genomes. Um, normally, for microbial resistance and just a single mutation, you would use the SNP software. But um, in certain cases, especially very highly uh, variable genomes like the, the viral genomes, you would use the SQA software. So this is a, an assay that was published by the CDC um, and is, is recommended by the CDC for uh, doing viral resistance of uh, influenza. So this region has about five mutations uh, for uh, adamantane resistance. They also have an, an assay for oseltamivir resistance. Um, but there's five mutations that infer resistance. There's also mutations around here that um, may or may not be relevant. Um, and also, depending on the species origin, whether it's bird or swine or human, uh, this, the sequence may be different. So this is, for all of these reasons, plus the fact that this is a, a very fast and easy and cost-effective technology, this is why the CDC has chosen pyro sequencing um, as their method of choice for uh, uh, looking at uh, viral resistance in these outbreak type of situations. Um, so if you're, I know a number of people have uh, signed up for this webinar just to look at um, influenza resistance. And uh, there are several publications that have come out of the, the CDC. And I would encourage you all to, um, to take a look at these, especially this uh, one at the bottom here that just came out this month um, on influenza genome analysis using pyro sequencing. Uh, they call it current applications for a moving target. And that, that really just sums up um, why you would want to use a sequencing technology um, for resistance screening of viruses, because it is a mu moving target. And the, the sequence uh, can change very, very quickly on you. This is another assay looking at viral resistance um, in HIV. And the point that I want to note here is that um, these sequencing primers contain multiple degenerate uh, bases uh, because the sequence is so variable. So you can see the pyrograms still look very nice, even with all of these different de degenerate bases. So the, the assay design is, is very uh, flexible and robust. So now I'm going to go switch gears and uh, now talk about using that directed dispensation approach uh, for quantitative mutation analysis and resistance detection. So uh, this is an example of, of uh, an assay where we're looking at a mutation. Uh, so in this case, what we, need, what we do is we enter what we call a sequence to analyze into the software. So we tell the software, uh, what the sequence is following our sequencing primer. And that will include the mutations that you want to interrogate. Um, and then the software will generate uh, a dispensation order. And this highlighted region here is, uh, is going to be the, the variable position. So how the software works, this is for uh, SNP genotyping. So uh, the software, uh, when you tell it what the sequence to analyze is, the sequence including your variable position that's following the sequencing primer, um, the software will generate theoretical histograms uh, depending on what your sequence is. So here are three different uh, theoretical histograms for a wild type A allele, a mutant G allele, or for a mixture, a 50-50 mixture of the sample. So what the software does is um, it will uh, take now the, the pyrograms that come off of the pyro sequencer and compare that variable position to these uh, theoretical histograms. And then it also uses sequence outside of the uh, variable position to determine uh, whether or not your assay is working properly. So because we have sequence context, because we're looking at not just the variable position, but the sequence around 
the variable position, we know that we are, uh, we can be really certain that we're looking at the correct sequence, that our primers have annealed to the correct places, that we're not getting any background in the assay. Um, and so what this basically is, is a, a positive, internal positive and negative controls within each reaction. So you don't actually have to have other controls on your plate. Um, so when we say you can do 96 samples at a time, you're actually doing 96 samples on your plate. Now remember that this is a sequencing technology, so we also don't have any problems whenever we're looking at mutations. We don't have any problems with very, very difficult mutations that uh, uh, probe-based chemistries might have a problem with. So here's an example of a triallelic SNP, um, and basically we just uh, dispense all three bases that are possible in this region, and the software can automatically determine what the genotype is. And we also don't have a problem with mutations that are very close to each other. Um, so in this case, we have three, three mutations very close to each other. A probe-based chemistry would have a very hard time trying to determine the genotypes of all of these mutations. Because this is a sequencing type of uh, chemistry, we can just place our primer upstream of this region and sequence right through all three of these and get the genotypes for all three uh, uh, variable positions in the same run. Now, I mentioned uh, that if you had two base incorporations at a time, you would see a double height peak. And I also uh, alluded to the fact that if you had a 50-50 mixture, um, you would see two half height peaks. So we kind of had an idea that this was a quantitative um, assay, so we wanted to actually see how quantitative this really is. So what we did was we uh, took a homozygous C and a homozygous T, and we mixed these samples in varying proportions and ran these all out on the pyro sequencer, and then plotted the relative peak heights against the expected allele frequencies as we knew what we had put into these reactions. And what we saw was this nice linear curve um, suggesting that uh, the relative peak height is very quantitative. Um, so this quantitative aspect can be used in a lot of different microbial analysis techniques. So you can look at viral fitness over time. Um, you can look at, uh, monitor the development of antibiotic resistance in a sample over time. You can also use this to quantitate the, the copy number of specific genes in your assay. And just as a side note, this is also the type of uh, technology that we use to uh, do our uh, methylation analysis on bisulfite-treated DNA. So this is a list of some of the uh, quantitative aspects, uh, uh, quantitative uh, targets that people are using to uh, look at mutations that co confer resistance. And again, you can uh, search for any of your particular uh, applications by going to pyrosequencing.com slash publish. All right, so now I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the um, more advanced techniques that people are using pyrosequencing for. Um, so here's a nice example where somebody has, um, on the same plate, they've done all of these different analyses. So they're interested in obtaining a lot of different information about helicobacter in this particular sample. So first they wanted to just uh, uh, sequence the 16S region of this uh, helicobacter to make sure that there is helicobacter in this uh, sample. And then in another well, they did another uh, a mutation analysis where they were able to look at two mutations and one assay that confer resistance. And in another few wells, they were looking at uh, the IL-1 beta gene of, the, of this person to determine the, if they had a risk for cancer. So the point here is that all of these analyses can be run on one plate in parallel. Now I know a number of you have signed up for this uh, webinar uh, for looking at um, environmental samples or, or samples that are highly have a lot of different uh, microbes within that. And conventionally, you basically had two options. You would either uh, start off by cloning all of your samples and then uh, sequencing each one of these individually. Um, 
Or if you have a really, really ultra high throughput, you would use one of the ultra high throughput uh, sequencing techniques. Um, but just recently, a few uh, companies have come out with um, some techniques that might uh, help you out to eliminate that cloning step. So, um, of course, the cloning, cloning and sequencing works very nicely, um, but it does take about three to five days uh, to do that cloning uh, step. Uh, the ultra high throughput approach it works very nicely if you if you do have an ultra high throughput, but it can be very expensive to run. Um, the instrumentation is is a significant uh, purchase, um, and also the data analysis is, it can be very cumbersome if you don't have um, a, a computer background. Um, so this is sort of maybe an application that. Um, be in between uh, the conventional cloning and sequencing and uh, the ultra high throughput method. So this is a, a single cell uh, PCR approach where um, if you happen to have a flow cytometer in your facility, you can use this flow cytometer to deposit single cells on a microscope slide and then you can use a special thermal cycler to amplify one cell at a time using a one microliter PCR reaction. And then you can take this, uh, uh, this PCR product now and you can sequence each cell um, in a full reaction on the pyro sequencer. Um, so this is another application where people are using, um, combining their qPCR results with pyro sequencing to very quickly screen out negatives and then identify their positives. So I mentioned earlier that um, pyro sequencing, uh, during the pyro sequencing wash step, uh, you do denature the two strands. So if you had uh, used a cyber green approach to uh, weed out negatives, um, to screen out uh, your negatives, um, when you do that denaturation step, uh, the two strands will wash, uh, separate, and any uh, cyber green that was intercalated will wash away as well. And so you can see here, this is an analysis of uh, this after using cyber green for qPCR, and the cyber green didn't interfere with any of the, um, the power sequencing results. So finally, I'm just going to um, compare and contrast some of the other possible uh, methods for um, microbial identification. Um, so if you haven't already um, switched to a, um, a molecular method and still trying to figure out whether or not, uh, whether or not you want to do DNA sequencing or uh, conventional microbiology uh, methods, um, this is just a summary. So sequencing can uh, type a larger range of species and strains in a more reproducible manner and generates highly portable data um, compared to your conventional uh, microbiology techniques. Um, doing a PCR with sequencing um, can facilitate a very sensitive test so you don't have to take uh, weeks or months to culture a sample if, you, if you're working with a sample that uh, needs to be identified very quickly. Um, DNA-based testing is also a rapid detection, uh, provide a, provides a rapid detection of resistance mutations and can complement your phenotypic test. So if you're working with somebody who may be uh, immunosuppressed or needs to know whether or not uh, they are resistant very quickly, or if you're working with an, an outbreak situation, a DNA-based testing can give you your results much faster than a, a traditional phenotypic test. Um, also, this type of technology is, demands less training. It can be less costly and can be readily scaled up for high throughput um, if you need to. And of course, uh, DNA sequencing can uh, be used on samples that can't be analyzed by conventional methods, uh, paraffin embedded samples, or uh, et cetera. Now, if you're already thinking about doing a molecular typing approach for your microbial analysis, um, Sanger sequencing and real-time PCR are sort of the conventional methods, but each of these uh, methods have uh, their positives and negatives. So Sanger sequencing can be labor-intensive, can cost 
uh, a significant amount of time uh, of money um, and takes a long time to do. And also, if you want to get quantitative data out of Sanger sequencing, you're probably not going to get down below 20 or 25 percent uh, uh, mutation level. Now, real-time PCR also has um, some positives and negatives. Um, but the nice thing about PIRI sequencing is that it combines all of the positives about real-time PCR and Sanger sequencing with the added benefit that you can do both of these types of applications on the same platform on the same run. And it's a lower cost per sample uh, type of platform um, because we don't use any of those gels or labels or pros. So uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, I'll be happy now to take any questions.